So what I, I don't think there's any clear answers, but it's important that if you know about the environment, the ethics, and the health benefits or not of foods, you can make your own mind up. So I, there isn't a definitive list, and it, you know, everyone might, is going to have their own different rules, just as you know, some people have religious rules and uh, others about food. I think people are going to start having environmental uh, views on these things. So again, it's not as easy <laughs> as uh, it sounds, and I, and, uh, and I certainly don't have all the answers yet. But coming back to the more, more simplistic stuff, I mean, what's unhealthy? Um, if you look at the NHS website, it looks clear-cut that low-fat foods are preferred, they're supposed to be healthy, and high-fat foods are bad, and um, they're quite positive about things like dried, dried fruits and positive about orange juice and diet drinks. If you ask 13 leading professors of nutrition now, uh, they're not so sure about that. Um, they, um, this is this whole area where there's no agreement, uh, whereas they have got agreement about eating bowls of plain rice, uh, eating biscuits and uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, and they're all in agreement, having lots of extra virgin olive oil and berries are good for you, although this conflicts actually with the uh, NHS advice. Um, they say you should have low-fat spreads. So things are improving, though. I think that's what I'm trying to say is actually uh, we are making progress. And when I go to nutrition meetings, virtually everybody is uh, in agreement that there's no, we should be abolishing this idea of low-fat foods. Uh, I don't hear anybody saying that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's the correct advice anymore. And I think, coming back to this idea of how we now conceive our, our food and our bodies, it's, it's in this much more complicated way. It's the idea that um, food is made up of 30,000 chemicals, not just carbs or fats or proteins. And our gut microbes are uh, made up of thousands of species that produce tens of thousands of chemicals, and these are all the things going on in our bodies uh, every millisecond. And it's all about these chemical interactions. So if, by starting to think of these in a, in a chemical way, in a, like a pharmacy way, we can start to get a handle on our health. And what I now have for breakfast and lunch has changed because of this whole concept of personalization. Uh, my old breakfast, which uh, many of you might uh, have, is a sort of healthy muesli, some skim milk, uh, a small glass of orange juice, and some, and some tea. Anyone have, does that sound familiar as uh, what we were taught would be a healthy breakfast? And I would sometimes have uh, oat porridge. Anyone like oat porridge? I think that's healthy. Um, And oats were supposed to, if you remember, back in the 1980s, were billed as a, an incredible health food to reduce your uh, blood cholesterol levels. Um, and, yeah, they do in, in laboratory animals and various other things, and humans in some tiny extent. But what this breakfast does to me gives me these really big sugar peaks. Okay? I, all this stuff is low-fat, high carb. And basically, um, for me, orange juice has the same effect as Coca-Cola. It just gives me a massive peak. And so I'm getting these big sugar peaks when I'm wearing these, these glucose monitors, which have revolutionized this whole area. And um, I'm getting dips after it. And we know that people who have these, these big sugar dips uh, accumulate problems and stress in their body and inflammation. And I, I also started, you know, I was often hungry three hours later. Um, so my new breakfast uh, is now, you know, full fat uh, yogurt mixed with kefir, nuts, seeds, berries, black coffee. Um, and that's, I have a nice flat uh, profile now. Nothing really happens. 
you know, I don't get a sugar peak, and I don't feel as hungry, and I feel I've got much more energy. And a uh, similar thing happened with my NHS lunch. Um, like most NHS hospitals, we have sandwich bar. We actually had a high-end high one being at St. Thomas's, a posh place. We had M&S. So you think, well, it must be healthy. And so it was, you know, this br on brown bread with those little granary ones and malted, and it looked incredibly healthy. The tuna is sweet corn, because I said, oh, don't want that meat stuff. You know, that's not good for you. Um, uh, a little fruit mango smoothie or a banana. Uh, you know, I was up here, just like a diabetic, eating this stuff. And I couldn't work out why, you know, my, I had my low energy levels in the afternoon. And I was doing that for 10 years. Um, and most doctors don't have time for a full sit-down meal, so it's just grab a sandwich and go. So this personalization, the fact that I tested myself um, and realized that this was particularly bad for me, was a revelation in how I started to think about food and all the things I was taught, um, even as a, a sort of medical expert who's had, had, you know, up to this time, I'd written a hundred papers on obesity and genetics and all these other things. Well, when it comes down to the practical advice, we were all given the wrong advice and all took the wrong end of the stick. So personalization is really important. And just at the same time as I was um, starting to write the book, uh, a couple of guys came to a talk like this, and I was talking about the diet myth, and they came out of the audience afterwards and said, we'd love to um, talk to you about forming a company. Um, these two guys, George and Jonathan, had been in the world of the internet. They would uh, working out al algorithms. Generally, there's annoying algorithms uh, that adverts that follow you around once you've made the mistake of clicking on a pair of shoes or doing some search on some uh, bizarre foreign holiday or something, then for the next three months, those adverts follow you around. Well, they invented these algorithms to do these incredible searches so that in a few milliseconds, they profiled you and worked out which adverts would best annoy you um, and with a chance of you buying it. Uh, but they wanted to do something a bit more meaningful, and so that's why they wanted to do health. So that coincided with them meeting me, plus um, I think so we had this continuous glucose monitors, which were invented about 10 years ago, and are amazing devices. I don't know if you've seen them. Um, and they have transformed diabetics, uh, their lives, because every five minutes you get a reading of your blood sugar just from this little disc that goes onto your phone and you can see what's going on in real time in your blood. It's quite amazing and they're, they're perfectly accurate enough to do this. So that means you can start seeing what happens when you have food and how quickly we react. Then you can also do these blood tests, things like cholesterol testing, triglycerides, which you normally have to go to your doctor, queue up for hours, you know, and then wait weeks, and they lose the results and the usual, you know, sort of debacle that happens. You can now do these things at home, just by a blood spot, and you can measure thousands of things now just with a dry blood spot, and you send it back to a lab. So you, again, you're in charge of it. Then you've got phone apps, um, so that you know, you can not only scan your food, you can see, um, you can look on barcodes to s see what's going on, but you can record your appetite, your mood, everything else, just like um, we did with COVID, for example. And everything about you can be stored on this phone, uh, and every response and all your sugar responses. Uh, and it's a way of giving you the information. You don't need a laptop or anybody. So we found during COVID that um, contrary to everyone telling us that nobody over 60 would be able to fill it in, they all could. You know, the actual limit was about eight, over 85, it got a bit tricky. But 60 or 85, not a problem. But everyone had written off people over 60. They were uh, unable to learn to, to use a basic mobile phone. Very interesting. So suddenly it is, you know, it is suddenly a, a research tool for everybody. Uh, and finally, we can measure your gut microbes in your poo with genetic sequencing methods that uh, 10 years ago cost 5,000 pounds per sample, and we can do now for, you know, at 
bulk, probably getting close to 100 pounds a sample. So these, all these things together, plus artificial intelligence, plus computing, mass computing, cloud computing, allows us to do things we didn't, couldn't have dreamt of 10 years ago. And uh, this company's doing very well. Um, it's, we've scaled up massively. We now have 45,000 customers and 230,000 waiting uh, here for, to get on that study. So this just shows you the power of um, what, what we're doing. And this is a, a chart that just shows you the studies that um, the Zoe company uh, started, originally started with these 1,000 people done at St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, most of them were twins and lots of other sub-studies. But now we've got these 45,000 people who've done the study at home, who basically, they're paying customers, but they're also agreeing to do research. So they're sharing their data, and allowing us to publish it. And I think this is very much the future way. Uh, because if I'd done this the conventional way through academia, I'd applied for a grant from King's College, I got all the ethics permissions and everything, um, I think I'd still be waiting to start the study. Um, the bureaucracy is so slow, the grant process, you only have about a one in four chance of succeeding every time. And it's an incredibly uh, uh, depressing way to, to work. Uh, so by academics working with industry, they can short circuit all this stuff and it gets done. Um, and the actual study, you, some of you have probably seen this, but um, this is, we intensively looked at a thousand people, giving them all identical meals at the same time of day uh, in, and measured the same things. And that's essentially what we've done with 45,000 people now. So we're getting this amazing database of people's individuality. So I won't go into the details, but essentially we look, this is a thousand people, normal people, given a muffin and looking at their glucose after it. There's a tenfold difference between those people. Tenfold difference in their response. And similarly, with the main circulating blood fat, uh, triglyceride, uh, which uh, happens about, this happens uh, usually within one to two hours, this happens sort of two to six hours. The fat takes longer. Some people get rid of that fat quickly, and others it hangs around. And until we did this study, nobody knew there was this huge variation. We just called everybody average. These are the average levels, okay? But they're not average for you or me. The, you know, the chances of us being average for both of those are extremely small. And yet all our advice was based on averages. So this is the whole idea of personalization. It's not just taking the average, it's realizing that we're all individual. We all have our own uh, normal level, if you like, an abnormal level. And the point of these peaks is that they cause inflammation. So if you've got your too much sugar peaks, the insulin goes up, uh, you've got too much fat in your system, it's hanging around, it's irritating the lining of the blood vessels. So it's causing stress to the system. That's the way to think about it. And it's a bit like uh, a smoldering fire in your, in your, bo in your body. It's not a huge fire because you're, you know, uh, you're not raging uh, with fever, but it's just that smoldering embers that are just causing stress to the system. And so the whole idea is we want to dampen the fire uh, to suppress it, and that's really the aim of what we're trying to do with all our advice. Okay, to smooth out those uh, stressful eating events. Because, you know, it's something that how we do every single day of our lives for decades. So a small effect has a real cumulative effect. And the other thing was a bit of a shock to me because I'd, uh, you know, I'd been a trained geneticist and been doing twin studies was that twins reacted completely differently to the muffin test. So identical clone twins uh, were hardly any, hardly more similar than uh, unrelated. There was a slight similarity in the sugar, no similarity at all in how they respond to fats. So suddenly, my old thinking about genetic determinism was thrown out. I had to change my mind about that. And 
I was also dubious of this whole idea about um, mood and food. I remember meeting people who used to say, hey, it's very strange, um, I have this real urge at 10.30 to go and have a, uh, two uh, chocolate digestives or a Kit Kat. It's an uncontrollable urge. And it always mainly seemed to be females who had this, and I feel faint. <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't believe any of that. That's a complete nonsense. You just, you know, just greedy, just like, you know, you just like a nice bit of sugar. But there was, but it turns out that when I was forced to eat uh, these muffins, um, as my only source, every four hours, I was at muffins for 24 hours. Um, I had all these sugar spikes and these dips, and I felt terrible. I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't do any writing, I, my brain just didn't work. So there's this whole concept of brain fog. Suddenly, I experienced it for the first time. So I had to eat my words and realize why it was happening. It's because all these people that were getting these dips three hours after eating a carb meal, not everybody, but the people that did, was genuine. They were in this position here, you know, where it was dipping below the baseline, something had happened, and we did another study and we correlated that with feeling tired, um, feeling mood was depressed, and importantly, they overate during the whole 24 hours. So these people, they didn't know what their sugar was, we told them afterwards, but they were recording on the app all these things. So one in four of you will, over, will overreact, you'll get a sugar dip that has this major effect on you when you're eating carbohydrates. And this, this does two things. It tells us the importance of personalization, and it's not just about the sugar peaks, it's about these changes that we need to look about, but also it makes a mockery of the all calories are equal, because I've given all of you the same muffins, identically measured out, identical calories, but in one in four of you, it's, you're going to overeat that day by two or three hundred calories. 10% more hungry. And that is really, really crucial to understand. So, yeah, it does affect your brain, and lots of studies now showing that uh, it's a pretty good treatment for mild anxiety and depression is to improve your gut microbes and improve your diet. It works at least as well as antidepressants. Um, and anyway, all this science led us to actually have a product which uh, launched in the US about a year ago and about here about four months ago. And it's rather than a test, it's a program. So we, we, we've, we've modified it. Uh, the idea is you get all these tests back from your sugar, your lipids, your microbes, and then you get all these scores created for you. Um, you get an overall score, and then each food gets a score. And the idea is you want to get, try and get as close to 100 as you can with your combination of foods, so that you're eating uh, high score means low peaks and good for your, your gut microbes as well. And we found that we need at least three months with people to work with a digital nutritionist to really just make them make healthy swaps. And the one thing we don't do is talk about calories. We ban the C word. Uh, and it's all about taking back control, realizing that calorie counting was probably the worst thing anyone could possibly do to their body, and importantly, completely ignores food quality. And this is, I think, the biggest evil we face at the moment is um, food companies, the advertising, it's all about calories, it's all about low fat, and all that is to disguise the food is rubbish. Good food really doesn't need a label. Um, and these are my results, just to... Everyone says, oh, well, aren't I, uh, aren't I healthy? And the Sunday Times said, there isn't a, uh, an inch of fat on him. And I said, well, I can show you there definitely is. Um, uh, I think he was just wishful thinking. But um, my results are pretty terrible. My sugar control was really low. Uh, my fat control wasn't much better. The only thing that was quite good was my gut microbiome score, um, which was in the top 10%. I've repeated these, and these have actually improved in the last three years. Um, but what's interesting, I also had this 
parasite. You know, I talked to you about these other bugs that we thought were evil. Um, turns out, um, you know, most of you would probably be quite worried if you had this a parasite in you. Uh, it turns out that actually it keeps you thin. And it's probably keeping me my weight down. It reduces my visceral fat. It reduces my blood pressure. It reduces my blood fats. And we have no idea why. We think it eats microbes um, that... Uh, uh, it changes the balance of the microbes, so you get more of the fat-digesting ones that break it down more efficiently. Uh, but there are probably many others like that that we know little about. And with these Zoe scores, as opposed to just ranking things in terms of calories and saturated fat, we've got now a different way of looking at food. And this is uh, my Zoe score for a whole variety of fermented and uh, dairy products and I've got lots of tables like this in the book, um, and you can see that uh, a lot of these would probably fail the government's test and say, well, kimchi is much too high in salt, uh, and it's probably got lots of um, uh, fats in it and nasty oil, so we'd score it badly, but actually it comes out as one of the top ranked ones in this, in this health system. Um, Greek yogurt, again, the government would say that's really bad for you. We're saying it's really good. And you get less scores for semi-skim milk. Uh, cheese, you've got cheese butter, fairly moderate. And we start scoring down low-fat yogurts because they're synthetic. They've got lots of added ingredients to them. Uh, they're ultra-processed. And they have less nutrient. There's no fat in there. There's very little good stuff in there. It's just all starches and uh, other stuff. And you can see children's yogurt, my favorite, um, really should have a health warning on it. Um, it is the most unhealthy food possible, and it's a disgrace that it is given such prominence. Uh, but because it has low fat, it can get a nice tick from the government to say this is healthy. Um, and uh, got other ones. We're, we're sort of working on that, some of these other ones, like these um, fermented foods, kombucha, coconut, kefir, water kefir, etc., and giving these probiotic scores, which means that it has live microbes in them. Okay, so uh, things that do really well are things like kimchi and uh, uh, kefirs, kombuchas, because they um, have the most abundance of, my, of live microbes and are now associated with health outcomes.